I'm going to bring Kim Stevens back to the mic. Kim is going to set the stage for the next couple of sessions that's going to take us through the rest of the afternoon. We've got a couple more opportunities in which we're hoping and expecting to hear from the audience. And with that, we're going to get right into things, Kim. Thank you, Richard. As part of the, part of the role of the, of the narrator is to be the dot connector and make sure that we, you know, we keep on target in terms of the themes we're trying to develop. And, you know, at, the, at the lunch break, Rich and I were reflecting in terms of how do we maybe capture a few points regarding the morning session. I thought maybe the first way to do that is actually to refer back to our roadmap. You know, and that reminds you of the fact that you know today is the Sustainable Street Restoration Day. That's what you were talking about during the town hall. And, and tomorrow is the restorative land development. And I guess I guess one way to look at the you know the objectives is that yes, you know, there was discussion of what was wrong, what's wrong, but also you know we're trying to also uh, set the stage for why we actually are making progress. And, and then, you know, the, the future is optimistic. It's not, it's not all negative. And so keep, keep that perspective in mind that, you know, tomorrow is going to be a totally different kind of pace in terms of the, of, of, of the subject matter. And again, you know, reflecting on some of our, you know, the points that came out of discussion today, and, you know, think right back to when Mary and Maine made his reference to the changing climate, and, doesn't that seem like a long time time ago that he was here? I mean, that's that's how things feel when you're in these days. It's very intense, and you know, you've heard a couple of references today to the to the norm, the new normal. I think this quotable quote from from Bob Sanford, who, for, for those of you who were here last year, I am Bob Bob did the keynote, and um, last last September, I worked with Bob in terms of developing. A storyline which for a speech he gave at the Asset Management BC a Congress, which Wally organized as he always does. And think back to last summer. What do you recall about last summer? The forest fire, right? You know, it was a lie about I'm good? Okay. Week after week of smoke. And the smoke extended right across the British Columbia to the prairies, and California was, was on fire. And, you know, Bob crafted this quote saying, after he talked, you know, he was talking to all the prominent scientists, and the belief was, last year, we crossed the threshold. But, you know, even though we've crossed the threshold, because things are different, you know, you have to be optimistic that, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's just the beginning of, a, of, of another. So, I mean, that's, that's the mindset you have to have. And that's why it was so, so good to have you Bill Derry uh, in, in this morning's keynote reflect on really almost 50 years. You think back to graduating, you know, in the early 70s, and here it is almost 2020. So, you know, been there, done it, and all that kind of stuff. So, keep that in mind. And one of the other things, I, I love Bob Sanford because every time we, we have him on the program, I, or I, I'm dealing with Bob, he always comes up with a gem, kind of gem that an audience can remember. And this one was actually from two years ago, in terms of, did you know, did you know that the water holding capacity of the Earth's atmosphere increases by 7% per 1 degree of Celsius? First of all, how do you remember Bob saying that a couple of years ago? But it becomes significant because what Bob was really framing a couple years ago was the importance of the atmospheric rivers. So I think it was Vaughn, was it, was it Vaughn who re I made reference to the uh, Panel Express? One of the speakers is mine, this morning referenced the Panel Express. And the fact that, you know, in recent years, when we get hammered by the Panel Express, we really get hammered by them, but it's wet. And that's why, you know, I was on the, before, before the uh, provincial election, there was, there was, I was part of the, uh, the, the climate action plan update in one, on one of the working groups, and uh, just have the, the group that I was on was predominantly people who uh, 
Their day jobs were, um, I guess, how do I describe it? They, they were worried more, more about buildings and stuff. And, we're, we're not, and I think Man, Manny and Shadi, you were in the same group. What, group. what was our group called? Anyway, you remember it? that uh, the whole point being of, of, of this slide is that, you know, it doesn't matter whether your building is platinum or gold, if we're being hammered by something which is bigger. And so, you know, where do you put your, put your energy? So that's an important concept to, to, to keep in mind. Because what we're seeing is more of this, right? Courtney, December 2014. You can have any, any number of communities. So, what we, you know, one of our guiding messages for this whole series of approaches that what happens on the land matters to streams. It's a very simple concept. But you know, as a as a water guy, you know, a person whose career has, has been in water, and I graduated uh, in '73, so you can figure out how old I am, and and the fact that uh, even in the water community, there's this, you know, there's traditionally been this disconnect between water and land. You have to keep reminding people by saying, "No, it's your land ethic that drives what's happen drives what happens to water." Because if you've got a, you know, if your land ethic is is not right then the consequences are felt in the stream. And our new normal, you know, floods and droughts, I can tell you the year for me which really defines the beginning of the new normal, 2015. So here we are in 2019, we are now into year five of what is the, near, the new normal, because 2015 cast your minds back how critical it was. Think of that graph that, that Vaughn showed where he highlighted 2015. And I can remember the conversations that I was having with folks in July of 2015, whether it was here in the RDN, or the Comox Valley, or Metro Vancouver, where a water manager was saying, my God, we cannot make it through to October or to November. Because, you know, as somebody who was trained in hydrology, you know, we used to, we used to do the theoretical five-month dry weather period in British Columbia, because it never happened. You know, realistically, yes, we did it in the house for five months, but realistically, it could never be more than three months. And so, in 2015, um, we were on the we were on the verge of hitting six months without rain. And we we're so lucky, in retrospect, that in late August there was a few days of rain, and reservoirs began to replenish, and we made it through. I think the other part about 2015, which really struck me, was that you know, memories are short. And you know, people forget, forget very quickly because, of course, by October it was raining. And so it was a bit of a surprise to me that when CBC did their annual, you know, what's the top story of 2015, that it was the drought. And so I was asked by CBC to do a whole series of interviews. Like one morning I was at CBC Studios and I did radio interviews with every region in, the, in British Columbia for you know, their network, and then on, on, on TV that night. And so the aha for me was not that the drought was, well, yeah, the aha for me was that the public consciousness being affected that much that in December they voted the drugs as a story of the year. Reference was made originally to the hard work of hope. That was the uh, that was uh, the topic that Bob Sefter delivered a year ago. The hard work of hope in a changing climate. And the question I pose is: Will we adapt? Will we adapt? That's the question, right? In fact, there are other other. Comment by uh, or a quote from, from Bob Sanford, you know, yes, the world is changing. But it's, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world, it's the beginning of a new world. And I think you might have gathered by my remarks at the closing of the uh, of the of the first module that uh, I'm I'm a cheerleader up because uh, Graham Bethel is here. Where's Graham Bethel? It's on the right. Where are you, Graham? Anyway, wherever he was, like, uh, many years ago, Graham Bethel said to me, you know, for some people the glass is half empty, and for some other people the glass is half empty. But he said, for you, Kim, the glass is, the glass is half full and the water level is rising. And he meant that in a very positive sense. So yes, we have the knowledge, we have the tools, we can restore balance to the water cycle, especially within the urban environment where we've really messed it up. Can we? Will we? Well, of course we can. But we have to recognize where we need to make the changes. So a hard work of hope in a changing climate. Will we adapt? Oh well, yes, but only if, but only if civil engineers, 
urban planners and decision makers truly change their mindsets and make restorative land development their number one priority and actually reconnect hydrology and ecology. Reconnect hydrology and ecology. That's a critical phrase because we spent the last half century disconnecting the two. And until we have that basic understanding, that's part of what we're trying to do through these two days. Yeah, it's not, not just have a town hall session for the sake of having a town hall section, session. Rather. Well, we, we don't want to present at you. We want to interact with you. But we also want to pass on some knowledge and some training and some education, build some capacity, so that this group, and that's why this morning I mentioned that, that, um, that breakdown of the audience, 40% uh, stewardship, 35% local government, the other 25 percent kind of a mixed bag. It's a, it's a diverse group. The educational challenge over these two days is to ensure that we give everybody this common understanding so that you actually come out of here with a common language, and especially with the stewardship sector. And think about some of the comments and how to turn what may be seen as negative comments into positive outcomes. You need to be able to ask the right questions. And, and Zoanne Morton, uh, when she did the co-keynote, uh, last year in Nanaimo made the point about the stewardship sector that you had to understand, you had to know the facts because if, if, you know, if, you, if you are giving out the wrong information you're only hurting your own credibility. So we're hoping that we can help actually help people today. As I reflect on my career, you know, and it's easy to say that the legacy of past community planning and infrastructure servicing practices is Floods and droughts, right? Because we have disturbed the natural balance of watersheds, especially the urban areas. You know, my career has been defined by floods and droughts, and it was the classical thing. You know, you have a drought in one decade, and you do a report, and you have a solution, and it goes up on the on, on a bookshelf, and then later that later that in that decade, you have a major flood, and you do the do the report and the solutions, and it goes up on the bookshelf, and the next decade it starts again. Some people call that the hydrological a hydrogeological cycle, right? But it defines your career a lot. A lot of people who want resource engineering. And Bill, that's kind of like your story of your career too, right? I think the turning point the last five, six, last five years really has become that we finally have a language that can get through to people in terms of it's all about the money, right? It's all about the money. And I look over at Molly Wells, NASA manager BC, and that's kind of the key part because getting people to understand um, simple concept like level of service, the life cycle implications and impacts of, of, the, of the actions that we do that for creek sheds, watersheds, um, the consequences don't show up for decades. But there always is a cost, right? So in terms of, you know, always the arguments for um, you know, a development and development cost charges, but over time, um, we're in a situation now where all local governments are well aware of what's. Well, yeah, I like to use the word uh, infrastructure deficit. No, no, we don't do the talk about infrastructure deficit. We talk about the infrastructure liability, right? Because that's uh, that's what we've incurred over time. So I always say to both boards and councils, if we cannot afford to replace our core infrastructure, water sewer rigs, water sewer roads, why the heck are you taking on an unfunded liability called drainage? Let's bring it back to our, its original word, drainage, right? <laughs> and how we remove water from the land and the consequences we have. And yet, you know, you have the opportunity to turn things around if you go back to the, back to the source. And so about I guess it was a, well, Bob Bill was with our work, right? It was, I remember going on the on the uh, walkabouts with the city of Surrey staff in, in, in the late nineties and thinking that you know, our interest our interest was in the potential for redevelopment because in British Columbia, when you're constrained by the mountains, the water, the U.S. border, and the agricultural land reserve, you have no choice but to intensify and redevelopment. So redevelopment was giving the opportunity to get it right the second time. Well, we're about 20 years into uh, having the opportunity to get it right, and so while we're making progress, we've had an awful, awful lot of missed opportunities. 
that's really how I would characterize the last couple, 20 years. We knew what we needed to do in the late 90s. People in some places have done it, but we haven't done enough of it. So to bring it back to the, the basics, which is really setting the stage for Neil and Sylvia, to make better decisions, we first must understand how rainwater reaches the stream. And believe it or not, not that many people really understand it, even amongst my fellow engineers. Because only then, when you have the basic understanding of what happens when that raindrop comes down from the cloud and how it eventually reaches the stream, will you be able to do the things we need to do to reconnect hydrology and ecology, and in so doing, go back to the future. We're giving you some basic language, some basic concepts. Standard engineering practice only considers surface runoff and analyses. Yet the flow of water is three, three pathways. And you heard references this, mo this morning to stripping away the interflow, interflow zone and, and sealing over the landscape so you can't recharge the groundwater. And that's because even if the people understood that there are three pathways, they don't necessarily understand the five concepts. That's why I really like when, when, when Gilles talks about one water, it's one water, it's how, it's how that one water reaches it. But you have to think in terms of the three components, the surface runoff, which could be from minutes to hours, the interflow, that shallow zone, that's from days to seasons, and deep groundwater, well, that's from years to decades or more. So you've got to have those three time frames in your mind, and think about what you're doing when you're disturbing that balance, and what it means in terms of time. It all comes down to, in the urban environment, when streams erode, there is more volume at higher rates over longer periods of time. And that's something that people didn't begin to understand until the 1990s, really. And to put it in perspective for you, here's the water balance by regional distribution by, by, by region. And look at for British Columbia. Interflow, especially here on the south coast, it's 60% of the total annual volume is, is interflow. That's that strip, right? That's the strip that historically we peeled off, slapped the turf down, and wondered why we had to pour the water on to maintain a green lawn. And that's the legacy that we're dealing with in terms of, you know, our practices overlooked, ignored, or eliminated interflow. And sort of, as I think, as I, as I, as I think back, one thought comes to mind. You know, when we did the guidebook, Peter Law, in his former life, as Ministry of the Environment, was the chair of the Intergovernmental Committee that was responsible for developing the guidebook for British Columbia. I was the project manager, the prime principal author, and when we first released the guidebook in 2002, we actually had people talking about interflow and the importance of interflow. And I tell you that within a matter of years, the word interflow had dropped out of language again. So you gotta keep reminding people. Again, trying to leave you with simple things, simple visuals, what the stream sees at one instant in time. We, this is on the back page of your agenda. So it's a, so a takeaway for you. But it gives you that sense of when you hear my colleagues, agent, you know, fellow engineers, tossing out terms like the 100 year, the 2 year, and the average flood, give you a sense of what that, what that means in terms of water levels. But just as important is, is the base flow, right? And, you know, and that, what's being sustained by interflow and aquifer, aquifer discharges. You know, that's what you're seeing a lot of the time of the year. And, you know, it's been great that we've had this you know, month of really nice weather, but you know we're going to pay for it, because it just means everything's drying up sooner. But my, other, my takeaway on, the, on this slide is that we tend to think of things as a cross-section, like an engineering perspective, or a point in time. If you learn, remember nothing else from what I'm saying right now, is that the complete story of what's happening when you sit and see that cross-section, you see that reference to the 100 year, the 2 year, it's, think of a video or a movie. It's dynamic, right? It's, it's changing. And if you're subjecting your stream to a flow rate that it hasn't experienced in years, but it's being subjected to that for a longer period of time, you're going to erode your creek channel. So, 
It's one of your takeaways. Make sure you read that last page because first page over there. Because when we're it was almost like a filler space for what's the Nick, and then the Nick said, "Well, we gotta add this and add that." And so in the end, we've got the complete story of, of what you need to understand about flow on one page. Why a workshop within a symposium? We thought long and hard about our program. We didn't, you know, I mentioned this morning, we did not want to be in the trap of, of um, convention thing where you get used to coming to a bunch of lectures. And so we blocked out the afternoon. So a lot of the stuff I've touched on and, and people touched on today, Neil and Sylvia, I've got to do that mini workshop over the next hour and a half. And I'm sorry, I'm still going to take your time. But <laughs> And um, why it's so important that Neil is here is because Neil is leading a provincial government program to train community stewards to undertake stream flow data collection in small streams. And the 40 plus people who attended yesterday's workshop are not, now understand the significance. Nick, I just got to have this commercial for you. Because after what, 33 years in DFO? And you're going to do the closing reflections, and you're going to kind of connect the dots back to what Bill said this morning. Because as Nick has said to me so many times, we knew this stuff 30 years ago, but people are, are, re are rediscovering what we knew, and yet we've lost 30 years of actually being able to do now on a larger scale. So reconnect hydrology and ecology. Focus on the root causes. Integrate restorative solutions. That sets the scene for tonight when storm, and I'm responsible for not having flagged it clearly in the agenda today where people are saying, when is it? Well, it's here at 6.30, doors open, 7 o'clock, you're on deck. And storm uh, has a lot of great quotes. I want to leave you with this quote from storm. In my experience, the civil engineering profession has trouble adopting the restorative mindset. The main problems in engineering is all about control and uncertainty. Urban planners have a similar problem, but living systems like watersheds and cities resist control and exhibit surprising behavior when they are healthy. And isn't that what Bill said too? So I stole some of your time, Richard. So the title of our talk was going to be Closing the Data Gap, Water Stewardship, Water Stewards. Uh, the key to the future, you always have to decide on your title really early. So it has evolved a bit since then. Let's see how these buttons work. So I wanted to start today with this slide. It's by a guy named Gus Benz. I don't know him personally. Like anything else, I learn everything from the internet. But he said, I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity, loss, ecosystem collapse, climate change. And he was hoping 30 years of good science could address those problems. He said he was wrong, and the top environmental problems are actually selfish greed, and selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. <clears throat> I like to think that Sylvia and I are on the science end. I don't necessarily entirely agree with this, because I do think we still need data and science in order to address some of these problems, or maybe identify and understand them. But I think, to me, what this says is we need more than just science and studies and published work and, and data collection, we need people in, in all angles of advocating for change that, that helps us to do better in the world. So we'll just give a brief outline, we're going to give a quick introduction, who we are, what we do, talk a little bit, uh, a bit about the science, that whole rainwater reaches the stream, we're really focused on groundwater and surface water, we're going to go through a few case studies, um, some challenges and actually some successes, and talk about some of the uh, initiatives in terms of stewardship work and their involvement in data collection and, and uh, resource decision making. So <clears throat> who are we? Well, you're looking at the two people that, we, by job description, we are the technical experts for what's called the West Coast region. I'll try and point to that. That's, that's this area in blue, not including the lower mainland. We basically look after uh, Vancouver Island and the central coast of Haida Gwaii. And this is the team. So we don't have 100 people working behind us. We oversee 70,000 square kilometers, roughly, of land, 200 aquifers, some 36,000 wells, some 1,500 watersheds. So if you wonder why we haven't been to your watershed, it's because we've been in the other 1,545. 
I am the regional <coughs> hydrologist, so I look after surface water. Again, my job description says I'm supposed to be the technical expert. I feel less and less qualified to be that every day, and the more that I learn. But <coughs> here's the gist of some of the things that we do. We do uh, flood response, drought response, some water science. The group that I'm in looks after dams and dikes as well. Uh, licensing and some uh, other things that I can't think of right now. So on, uh, the, I'm Sylvia Barroso, as uh, already stated, and on um, the groundwater side, so the groundwater protection program um, in West Coast region, we uh, have about uh, more than 80 groundwater observation wells. That's part of our observation well network, where we monitor groundwater level and uh, temperature, and in some cases uh, quality. We do compliance and enforcement of the Water Sustainability Act groundwater protection regulations, so working with the well driller and well public water industry and well owners to maintain their wells. Um, and we do science, we work with our partners in governments, other governments, Ministry of Environment, and uh, regionally to undertake groundwater science, so act for mon monitoring water budgets. And, um, and uh, we also provide assistance to water authorizations for groundwater licensing. So we're going to cover a bit of science here. When I take my daughter to a reading time, they always say you have to put on your listening ears. We're going to try and cover a lot of ground in a very short amount of time, so also put on your thinking brain. So some of the stuff has been said before, we're going to say it again just to try and beat it to death. I have here the groundwater surface, we're talking about groundwater surface water interaction over the next few slides. This is the, what I'd like to think of as the famous water cycle that's been talked about before. Um, basically, it's the cycling of water through the atmosphere and back to the earth. As you can see, it goes up into the clouds there, falls down into the streams and lakes and onto the ground, is absorbed into the ground surface and eventually keeps cycling around. And as people have alluded to, anytime you make some sort of disturbance in there, building a Walmart or something else, obviously, you interrupt that cycle in some form and interrupt those transfers and you can expect that to propagate throughout the system in some way. We're going to focus in on the stream channel because groundwater and surface water, this is where they come together. So often the groundwater and surface water are interacting in, in some form and we simplify it in basically these four diagrams. So on the top left we've got a gaining stream, that's where at least conceptually the groundwater is flowing into the stream. Top right, we've got a losing stream. Groundwater is flowing from the stream into the aquifer. If the groundwater table is low enough, you have some form of disconnection. In this case, they've illustrated that the stream channel is losing water to the aquifer, but through a, an unsaturated zone. And in the bottom right, sort of a neutral condition where water is being exchanged between the aquifer and the stream in some fashion. Um, on any particular system, you can expect this to occur in all its various forms, usually along the length of the stream. The stream tends not to be all gaining or all losing. It'll gain in some reaches, lose in some others. And then as well, it'll change through time. Some places, sorry, sometimes years it'll be gaining, sometimes years it'll be uh, losing. All depends on how the water table is moving. All right, so um, as water scientists, we understand uh, there's no free water. So um, any groundwater pumping is going to uh, be compensated for by a change in storage in the aquifer or uh, capture of water that would normally discharge to the stream, capturing that water, or induced recharge, so pumping of water directly from the street, stream channel into the aquifer. Um, in a bedrock aquifer system, we might also have hydraulic connection between the surface water and the groundwater system. So say, for example, a bedrock well pumping in an alkaline setting might lower and depress the water table and affect stream uh, flow to a nearby spring, which contributes to overland flow and, and stream flow down below, or it can affect the water that is normally recharging within the mountain block or regional flow system and discharging down into that valley bottom on consolidated or sand gravel aquifer. Um, when we look at a real case scenario rather than a, a conceptual diagram, uh, we realize that this uh, the increasing complex complexity of these natural systems. So here's a cross section of Captain River Aquifer, uh, construct, uh, made with information from well construction records. So the river is here, um, and you can see that it's a complex layering of systems. And you've got wells at varying depths and in different aquifer layers that are more or less connected to the river system. 
So um, one of the ways that we might uh, understand if there's hydraulic connection or not between surface and groundwater is to look at a hydrograph or the groundwater level change over time. So here's a hydrograph of, um, of a well that is not hydraulically connected to a stream. So it shows within this coastal area, we tend to wear rain-dominated systems, so we have high, highest groundwater levels in the winter following recharge. And then over the summer, or spring and summer period, groundwater levels will naturally decline due to uh, discharge and through pump, uh, the effects of pumping. Following, following fall and winter, you get a rebound of the, the water levels. So here's some um, information from Couch and River. Um, first, so we've got the river trace here, and we've got wells, observation wells, and production wells uh, located uh, adjacent to the river. Um, and you can see that the groundwater levels basically mimic uh, very quite closely the surface water levels. So um, we can see there's a strong connection. We can also look at indicators like temperature. So in this region, um, groundwater temperature tends to average about 10 degrees, where surface water will change the temperature over time um, and with peaks in the summer. Um, so here's the river temperature, and you can see that the groundwater temperature also rises uh, depending on the distance of the river from the, of the well from the uh, stream. So uh, another way that we might look at uh, indicators of groundwater uh, surface water connection or hydraulic connectivity is to uh, pump, uh, conduct a pumping test. So a pumping test gives us information about uh, well productivity and also um, about the subsurface conditions. And if uh, surface water, so when a well is pumped, the water level or surrounding it will become depressed and form this cone of depression. And if that cone of depression intercepts a source of recharge, such as a surface water body, then the response of the water level in the well will will uh, reflect that. So here's a standard uh, pump test of a well that's not hydraulically connected. Um, you can see that uh, over time the drawdown in the well becomes constant and um, it, it draws down at a constant rate over the, the period of the, the pumping test. Um, here's one well that is located uh, in Yugo, adjacent to Couch and Lake. Um, so, during the initial phase of the test, the water level drew at a certain rate, and once that point of depression hit the lake shore, or a source of recharge, then the rate of decline of groundwater levels in the well also diminished, reflecting that recharge was occurring. Um, here's a really highly productive well for the city of Duncan, located in that same Couch and River aquifer. Um, and uh, you can see that they were pumping at over 2,000 U.S. gallons per minute, and uh, the well itself is located about 100 meters from the river. And uh, the with drawdown within the well stabilized within the first minute, a minute of pumping. And there was no further drawdown over more than 24 hours of pumping after that. So again, very strong hydraulic connection. Um, we can also uh, prepare models that show, uh, that predict interaction between aquifers and surface water. So um, here's for the Couch and River system, um, and it basically shows that along different reaches and different areas, depending on aquifer materials and topographic uh, gradients that drive the system, you can have locations that are naturally gaining, so they're receiving groundwater recharge and naturally or naturally losing um, as a result of the, those conditions. The zones that we have gaining conditions. We know uh, the biologists find that there's congregations of uh, aquatic species like salmon, um, and that just basically highlights the importance of these types of thermal refugia for aquatic habitat and the importance of groundwater to aquatic habitat. And here's a little interesting one from a coastal setting, um, an aquifer or an observation well that we have in Saturn Island, um, which shows a very characteristic. Um, mixed semi-diurnal pattern, which those of you who do marine research would recognize as a tidal influence. So we have uh, that type of uh, groundwater surface water connection as well. So hopefully that, okay, hopefully that impresses on you that the two are intrinsically connected, which we've known for a long time, but maybe haven't necessarily appreciated in every minute. So. <clears throat> We're going to move to what that means in terms of surface water and surface water flow. So this is a typical storm hydrograph. Now you can hear. Um, on the left side there, these little bars are supposed to represent precipitation of 
rainstorm over some amount of time. And what this is essentially trying to illustrate here is that the discharge in the river is going to increase as a result of precipitation and then decrease at some point. And they've broken it down into these three components, base flow, through flow, and surface runoff. Surface runoff being the most rapid component Kim spoken about in this uh, talk just before us. So this is your most rapid overland flow, water just running off the landscape right into the stream and forming quite a bulky or storm flow. Uh, through flow is going to be that word. Quick flow, sometimes called, is basically the stuff that moves through the shallow brown water makes it to the stream relatively quickly. You can see how it's sort of an increasing component during the storm as the, water, as the ground becomes saturated. Uh, but this is what we're most interested in our talk, is this base flow, the flow that's supported by the deeper groundwater and, and water out of the aquifer. Basically because we're managing this, trying to manage the resource, water as a resource, this stuff disappears quite quickly. So if you can, if you can get your hands on that, you can, you can use it, but it comes at the wrong time of year for a lot of things. So <clears throat> the top's cut off here, but it does say, well, let me read the slide over here, what can we expect our streams to do in the absence of precipitation? So on the island, Historically, we can say, well, there's so much water available in winter, who really cares what's in the summer? Um, but what happens in the summer is pretty critical. So now with, with thinking about fish habitat, uh, aquatic health, and that sort of thing, we, we are quite concerned about how streams behave through the summer in the absence of precipitation. All my most critical points are cut off, apparently. So there, there was the number one, two, three, and four here. Conceptually, we're thinking that there's a few different possibilities of how the stream should behave. So once it stops raining, as the summer goes on, what happens to your streams? Do they decline at a constant rate to zero? Do they have some sort of an exponential decline, so the rate of decline is declining? Do they reach some sort of steady state, or do they have this inexplicable state? It's like a camel. The inexplicable one is the most often what we see because we have systems that are allocated in surface water and groundwater, they have reservoir releases, they have people building dams or moving down the river or doing whatever they're going to do. And so instead of following, following some nice natural trend, we have all sorts of things that are, that are confusing the issue. But in the end, this question here says, is, is there an infinite supply? So the Earth is of finite size. Any resource on that Earth must be in finite supply. With water, we have the luxury of the water cycle. So water is taken back up in the atmosphere and recycled back onto the land. But if we took away the precipitation, would we have an endless amount of water in the aquifer to supply us for base flow forever? Yes, no? I don't think so. So this is a, a plot of Bonsal Creek. So discharge along here. These are some rainstorms that happen towards the end of the summer. Basically, you can see this one declines down to a, about a steady state and is supported by a few little rain events towards the end of the, towards the, end of the year. But we see this in a lot of streams where they decline to a point and they never seem to go much lower. But presumably you would eventually run out of water. Like Bunnell Creek. So Bunnell Creek is about halfway between Nanaimo and Parksville. And as you can see, uh, there's no water in it. So it runs dry early in the summer and it does not have any water into it until late in the fall when there is enough precipitation to cause stream flow in this gravel, nice gravel bed channel. It does have other problems for those of you who recognize what this problem is. Um, there is some water. Here's under the highway. There's a nice little pool here, but those pools will dry up as the summer goes on. Um, and I will tell you that the problem in this channel is, is a lot of sediment aggregation in the lower river. So what do we have in 2018? <clears throat> this is about four months of precipitation, Victoria, Shemana, Sol, Qualcomm. We have essentially zero precipitation, even though there's little storms recorded here. Six millimeters after a long dry spell does very little to overcome your soil moisture deficit. Uh, what we saw in the Shemanus River during that time was initially a rapid decline and a sort of almost what seems to be a, a what could be an asymptotic to a steady state. But again, even at the lower end, we're still seeing a slight decline. We could expect to see this river go dry. Again, this one is sort of confused because there are Groundwater licenses, there are surface water licenses, and there are reservoir releases, and there are some very large pumping systems. There are also agricultural licenses that offer return flow. There's diversion systems that take water from the river but put it back in. So these are all things that confuse a nice simple water balance. But here's the zero level, and this is about 100 liters a second, and the Shemanus is not a small system. 100 liters a second is a very little amount of water to have at the end of the summer. Contrast that with Nile Creek. Nile Creek's a little ways north of here in the bustling metropolis of, I think, 
Bowser. Um, during that same period, it has the same flow all summer long. It does not seem to care. Uh, it sits on quite a porous formation, and you have these little um, oscillations in here, which right now we tend to believe are basically the vegetation using the water, depressing the water table and, and causing these fluctuations in the uh, groundwater flow into the river. But <clears throat> will it continue like this forever? If it never rained again, would you would Mile Creek flow continuously forever? I don't think so. Um, this goes back to what a lot of people have talked about. Mostly today, I think you see, this is, let's say, humans and rivers a little bit cut off, but the idea of all our activities on the land base are going to have some sort of impact. We have done a lot of this. Uh, yesterday, Dave Derrick's organization down there in the U.S. Army Corps, they've straightened a lot of rivers, haven't they? He's not going to know it. Not many of us, most of the farmers and local. Yeah, locally straight. But we did some. There you go. We've done quite a bit of this sort of thing. We've done a lot of this sort of thing, and you, and you can't do that without having an, some sort of impact. Oh, it's still me. So what we brought is we have the Water Sustainability Act, which uh, was introduced in 2016, and we're just going to race through a few things here to highlight some of the, the, the things that the Water Sustainability Act did. The old Water Act was over 100 years old and um, was really not necessarily for the purpose of conservation or stewardship. It was nicely made, mainly designed to resolve conflicts in our water. Um, with the new Water Act, we have the addition of groundwater licensing, uh, non-domestic groundwater licensing, we have this thing called environmental flow needs, and at least at some point in the future, there'll be things called sustainability plans and government options. They're being developed in regulation, so they don't really exist yet. Um, groundwater licensing has been a big step forward, so hopefully you all appreciated all the data that Sylvia showed you that groundwater and surface water are one resource. So if we tr before with the Water Act, we were only licensing surface water. Now we can license the non-domestic groundwater. It does give us a uh, much better record of groundwater use. It gives us some powers of regulation, and it recognizes aquifers as an entity under the Water Sustainability Act, and recognizes that hydraulic connection. So from a resource management perspective, it's, it's big. We couldn't really manage groundwater before. Um, environmental flow needs is a big one. There was really nothing in the Water Act before that spoke to aquatic ecosystems, um, compensation for damage, these sorts of things. So there were a few things around pollution. So environmental. Flow needs are designed, let's, let's read this together, to, to preserve the volume and time and flow required for the proper function of aquatic ecosystems of the stream. It has to be, or it's, it's strongly recommended to be considered in decisions relating to water licensing and connected aquifers. And then we have another thing called the critical environmental flow threshold. So the volume of water in a stream below which you can expect, what is it called, significant or irreversible harm to the aquatic ecosystem or the stream. And we've written down here is the biological red line for fish. So this is a, a nice um, idea in theory. It is very difficult in practice. Uh, one reason is the idea of significant harm is subjective. So one person's idea of significant harm is different from another. So often from a provincial regulatory perspective, we are looking at what will stand up in court. And it's difficult to say exactly what significant harm is. We, we struggle with debating this all the time. Irreversible harm is another one that's quite tricky because irreversible harm is a significant collapse in a fish population. Until the fish population collapses, you don't know it's going to collapse. So uh, the ups and downs in the fish population, you, we, we can sort of estimate the threshold below which we think all the fish are going to die, but until all the fish die, we won't know that we were right. So it's, it's, it's a very tricky thing to work with. Uh, what does EFN essentially mean at least to us, I would say it reserves and prioritizes water for aquatic function. So, whereas before, um, all the water in the stream would be available for licensing, although everybody saw it a little bit differently. Some water managers kept more water back, some did. This gives the ecosystem some standing under the act. But we have a lot of challenges up here. So, you know, that critical environmental flow threshold that I mentioned, somebody has to figure out what that is. And that flow is different at all points in the system. It's different on different systems. It's different for different species. It's an extremely challenging thing to address. And you could, you could put a whole team of people on this to work endlessly on it. And we, we have done that. We've hired one person. 
Um, so it's a question of how much water is reserved, how, how much do you actually keep back for fish, and is that water even available in the stream now? We've been licensing since the late 1800s, and in 2016 we started recognizing the ecological function. Um, there's also the question of flow naturalization. So most records of hydrometric data don't predate allocation, they don't predate um, people knocking it out in a river. So what was the natural flow? What was the natural ecosystem function out there? I don't know. Um, and then again, the data to support this. So it's very labor intensive to collect data. This will lead into our whole stewardship thing later. We now have to consider groundwater into it, and all this is incorporated into our resource management decisions and our, our regulatory actions as well. Okay, so now we've got the concepts going, we'll, we'll do one uh, little case study about uh, a basin where groundwater and surface water interaction is really important. Um, it's in the Coquisila River watershed, which is uh, a watershed located um, just south of Duncan, Duncan is here. Uh, the watershed is mostly privately managed forest lands, about 80% of the watershed, and then all of this uh, concentration of groundwater use, these dots, and, um, and development is in the lower third of the watershed. Um, it's historically been a really important uh, watershed or river for uh, anatomous species, trout, salmon, uh, it's in, uh, spiritually and um, economically important to the local First Nations and community. And um, for the last few decades, several decades, there's been issues with respect to low flows in the stream and high water temperature. Um, so uh, here's a species periodicity chart which shows um, the different life stages of different salmonid species within the Coxala system. And, um, some, and you can see that for some species like Chinook and Coho um, and the trout, they uh, inhabit the, species, the stream during this yellow period which is the low flow period. So they uh, are reliant upon um, flows within the stream for rearing and juvenile migration at that stage. Um, in comparison to Chum, which are already out of the system at that stage, and so maybe they might not be as impacted. So what do we look at, uh, what do we see in terms of escapement numbers? Um, just as an example here, um, we have Chinook, a uh, traditional population uh, averaging around 400 uh, odd fish, and the latest count in 2006 showed eight fish in the system, so something um, is going on. Uh, they didn't count on that day. And then here's some chum, chum escapement numbers. So uh, although the latest count in 2015 had possibly declined from historic numbers, they're still not as uh, detrimentally impacted in comparison to other escapement or other uh, species that were seen. So um, this is the comparison of the mean discharge in August within the stream compared to water usage or water demand on the system. So the blue representing surface water demand, the green is groundwater, and this is the red is the total. So the, um, in 1980, recognizing that there were problems with the Coca-Cola system, uh, they discontinued issuing any surface water licenses. Since that time, the number of wells developed in the, in the basin increased uh, exponentially, such that current ground of total water demand on the system has essentially doubled um, past the point which they had already said um, that there were problems occurring. Who's using the water? Um, it's mainly for agriculture and a smaller amount for industry. And when we think about agricultural water demand, especially for irrigation, that tends to be focused within the dry season um, when we're already having problems with uh, naturalized growth. Um, residential water use is obviously much smaller proportion. And so uh, when we're thinking about groundwater and surface water interaction, we think about the hydraulic connection, we could conservatively estimate that, um, that all the groundwater wells are hydraulic connected. So there's about 1,200 wells in the basin, about 850 wells that are located within a kilometer of the stream. Um, more recently, we've done some detailed work on, and analysis of the subsurface lithology and show, basically shows that what we, that conservative estimate is true, that all of the, the wells from the great majority are hydraulically connected. Um, in terms of flows in the river, um, since 2015 or earlier, but especially in 2015, 2017, 2018, um, very, very low flows, historic low flows in the river. Um, last year we had a period um, by which uh, the 
critical environmental flow threshold is set as 180 liters per second. Um, it went below that and was actually below 150 liters per second for almost a month period until the rain uh, started in early September. So what can we do um, with these new tools under the Water Act, uh, Water Sustainability Act? Um, we, if in a, in a case where we're thinking that the environment is, is threatened, um, we have the ability to issue these temporary protection orders. Um, there's a couple different options. A fish population protection order allows us to regulate the rate, timing, or type of water used from the stream. And that would actually be preferential to us because we could say uh, regulate users uh, that are located closer to the stream or the big, big ticket users and, and try to get more water flow back into the system. Um, in comparison to a critical environment of low protection order, which would have to rely on that first in time, first in right principle. Um, but for the fish population protection order, there's a greater burden of proof before we can move on that. Um, so that's a, a challenge. And so what would happen if we were to actually turn people off? Well, we did an economic analysis of economic in impacts. And so for that one month August uh, shutdown, it could have an economic impact of over $4 million on the local farming committee. Um, because those would be preferentially um, impacted by um, reducing water use. And those impacts could be felt not only um, within the current year, but in subsequent years. So say, for example, of irrigated crops, um, uh, orchards, binary, uh, vineyards, they could lose part of their, their stock, or um, in terms of livestock, they might, you know, what are they going to do in terms of water, uh, to water the animals they might have to cull, or relocate um, some of their herds. And then, how to this within um, the, the difficulties that we face in terms of where are we getting the data that's helping us to analyze what's happening in that system. And basically, we had uh, two surface water monitoring stations that bracketed the, the reach uh, over which we saw the greatest decline in, in flows, and we knew that there was the greatest surface and groundwater use, um, but we didn't have, um, we obviously, ha we didn't have any groundwater monitoring within the basin, because uh, previous to this, the groundwater um, ob observation well network had focused, we didn't have this focus on integrated management of the surface and groundwater. So, recognizing this, we've established two new observation wells within the basin, and we hope to construct two more. So hopefully we're impressing on you the, the managing one resource and the challenges of managing that resource in, in systems like the Coast Island. So talk a little bit about the role of the province that's not just ourselves, but other people involved in the decision-making process, informing decisions, making decisions. Um, we're part of the resource stewardship sector, in this case our resource is water. Uh, under the Water Sustainability Act, we manage water allocations, so licenses, that includes dams as well, storage licenses. Uh, the other thing is works in a stream, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, if you ever want to do any work in or next to a stream, you need permission, you need a permit from the province. Uh, we also enforce the Water Sustainability Act, so situations where people take water without a permit, store water without a permit, or do works in an about the stream without a permit, we have penalties for that, and we, we do the work, technical work related to that. Um, and then these things called water reserves, so reserves for things like agriculture or First Nations, there's a, there's a big bit, I should say business, there's, a, there's a, a lot of work going into figuring out in terms of treaty negotiations how much water is, is, should be left over for First Nations. And here's a good example of it, so something like this has a license, it's a structure, and it's taking water and it's using water, so both an allocation and a works issue. Um, just to try and impress on you the complicated nature of decision making, if you are familiar with the vacation destination of the Okanagan. A uh, city like Kelowna gets most of its water from Mission Creek. It's got a number of large water purveyors. All those water purveyors hold a license for distribution of water to their clients in the Kelowna area. So out of the Penticton office where the water manager sits, they might make a decision here on Mission Creek, and it may only be a small license. But the Okanagan Basin here is part of, obviously, the larger Columbia system, and you think if uh, all of these little tributaries, both you know, in Canada, and all the way down through the U.S. and many of these states, and I don't know how the Americans make those their decisions down there. Um, I don't even know how the decisions are made on this side of the basin. But how do all those little decisions add up to what's going to be happening as you progress downstream on the club? Um, and our, in order to understand that, you're going to need quite an expensive connected network of, of 
data and understanding of relationships in order to manage resources like this. And this, this happens on big and small systems, the idea of uh, cumulative impacts of big and small decisions. So what do we need for better resource decision making? Well, I would say a better understanding leads to better management. Um, our first step, at least in our view, is, is the raw data. So you collect the data in order to understand the process, and the more data you collect and the better you understand the process, the more you understand the variability and uncertainty. So a lot of people talk about climate change. Climate change has a lot of uncertainty. We have reasonable historic records dating back you know, tens of years, maybe up to 60, 80 years, but in terms of a changing climate, in terms of long-term climate cycles, in terms of some of the variability that's inherent in those, variable, in the, in those sorts of variables and that sort of data, it doesn't always do us a whole lot of good in terms of understanding all the variability. You add to that the uncertainty of what the climate is going to look like in the future, and you can, in some cases, just disregard your historic data and try to anticipate what's going to happen. But it, you know, on a large scale, there is a lot of work being done on this side. So on the data side, uh, the province has been doing some, some good things. So. Uh, we have a lot of data tools. These are all sorts of data sources that the province maintains in a way of, of collecting, storing, and, and disseminating data for your use, for the use of people who make decisions, for the people who inform decisions. Um, one that was mentioned earlier, the EMS system, the Environmental Management System, that stores a lot of water quality data. And the new one that we quite like is this real-time water data system. So uh, it allows us to, it, it, it's provided us a database with which we can store uh, groundwater, surface water, Snow data is in there now, and water quality data is supposed to appear in there at some point. Um, it's run on this Aquarius web portal, the Aquarius system. So this is what it looks like right now. Anybody can go on the web page and click on it and get data from any of these points. Um, make the dots big enough, and it looks like we have fantastic coverage in southeast Vancouver Island there. Um, but it's all available, all available for download. If you click on it, there's a little bit cut off here, but there's options on the side, there's drop downs on the top, there's various chart options. You can customize these charts and view the data in any which way you want. And this is something that we're working on in terms of getting as much data as we can in here to make it available for people to, to use. So we want to make the data publicly available. Uh, another thing that we have going on is the, at least on the west coast, so for those people who aren't on the islands, Something you can dream of having in your region. Uh, they do have something like this at Camloops too, but this is our drought information portal. So we've identified a number of watersheds that are uh, at risk for one reason or another. And this summarizes the drought level, so that's an indication of how much conservation we're trying to encourage in the water users in that basin. And it also has these little points here, are things you can click on to view the data from that basin. And it's the data generally that we're using to support our, our assessment of drought. Um, in our work as, as technical people, we love data and we would love to have more data. So we sort of compiled this chart that shows you all the different kinds of data that we, we might be using in any particular decision or project or something else, and, and some indication of, of the people up here who might be collecting. So federal government, provincial up here, we've got Water Survey of Canada, some provincial government staff, local government, uh, First Nations NGOs, water users, there's also industry, academia, all those sorts of things. The green ones are generally the ones that are available, publicly collected data by publicly paid people and made available on public systems and databases. Data that is, is sometimes available, but not always. And that data that is not usually available and we don't necessarily know about. Um, like I said, more data, better understanding, better decisions. If we, could, if we could get all this data available, especially if we could make it available all in one place, would go a long way to helping us figure out how to do things. Um, and the province recently introduced this. It's the, as it say at the top there, share your water data. Water quality, groundwater, I think, surface water. There's a little questionnaire stand here you click on, but we're looking to collect or have submit, people submit their continuous data. So you can now go to a web page and fill out a form to, to submit data for to the province to be included in our, in our databases. Okay, so um, this is a, a little bit more of an uplifting uh, case study. <laughs> I'm talking about the value and, and importance of community monitoring and involvement in, in ensuring success of uh, a study. So uh, it's also an island water budget um, and looking at um, 
the Dublin community there. So Salt Spring Island is a large of the Southern Gulf Islands. Um, it has uh, most of the surface water, the main surface water bodies on the island are at carrying capacity now. There's uh, limited groundwater, they have fractured bedrock aquifers. Um, there are a lot of development pressures on the island, and um, but simultaneously there's a huge uh, community of engaged individuals that want to contribute to um, their community and uh, get involved in science. So um, we undertook a water budget study on the island to try to look at the primary and the groundwater availability and uh, involved a range of different partners. Um, the project was undertaken in a um, two-year period, so the first year was uh, for mapping and data collection phase. Um, we engaged um, critical partners to provide data uh, that could be fed into the water budget at uh, the second phase of the study in the second year. So, for example, Ministry of Agriculture undertook um, agricultural water demand estimates um, over the first year, and that was really important to add into um, the, the water balance. Um, so this is an uh, equation that represents basically a water budget is uh, a balance of the inputs and outputs within the water cycle. Um, on the Salt Spring Island, because it is an island system, essentially all of the water that's available for ecological or human use comes from precipitation that is received within the footprint of the island. Um, and then from that receipt, then it gets divvied up into uh, different components, um, so evapotranspiration, um, the uh, groundwater pumping, so we had really good data. Um, the Islands Trust and uh, Salt Spring Island Water Protection Alliance um, worked with the community to gather information on water demand and usage, um, and that was really uh, useful to have. Um, um, one of the things that was uh, difficult to quantify and ended up being a big source of error within the budget, the water budget, was this uh, groundwater outflow or base flow component out to sort of streams. Um, but bas basically the success of the project um, partly was to mobilize the community and also to see how the different data sets could be captured from different sources. So when we started out, um, you know, the problem, provincially we had these three uh, groundwater observation models um, present with uh, groundwater level monitoring. Um, through the data collection initiatives, through the water, um, Water Protection Alliance staff and a dedicated staff, and so we were able to gather information on groundwater levels and water usage from different purveyors. Um, and then uh, we undertook some funding. Islands Trust uh, took lead in got funding from the Real Estate Foundation of BC, and we were able to establish 10 new community uh, observation wells using existing wells on the, on the island. Um, and then now, more recently, um, the Freshwater Preservation Society are developing and engaging local community in monitoring to try to develop a freshwater catalog, which would basically be um, a catalog of information or, or uh, scientific data from the different water systems. Um, provincial networks, I mean, we have, we have some really uh, great data, um, but they can be costly to install and maintain. So, um, one observation well could cost us maybe fifteen to twenty thousand dollars each to install, and about eight thousand dollars to uh, equip. Um, they're typically purpose-built, and they would be established for long-term data sets in, in um, trying to, to develop those long-term data. Um, we have dedicated staff, and we provide that data publicly. So, what about those community uh, data? data or monitoring networks, well, they can often be a lot more economical. So, for example, with the community monitoring network on Salt Spring, um, because they used existing infra infrastructure, um, they cost maybe about $1,000 to establish a station. They can be uh, flexible. Um, if you find that the monitoring is no longer useful at that site, you can redeploy your equipment and move it to something else, or you could do short-term, more high-intensity data collection in one area for specific studies. Um, one thing that I think that is really we want to plug is that um, the, those data collection standards uh, and training really improve the value of the data for um, use. So ensuring that the people that are engaged in collecting it have the information they need to be able to undertake quality assurance and quality control. Um, and that we ensure that when those efforts are made, that, that community energy gets mobilized by making that data available for scientific use. We're almost done. If you're still paying attention. I put this slide back up, but this time I added a picture. 
So again, just to impress it, it's that raw data, that process knowledge, that variability and uncertainty. So with the Salisbury and Allen case, the involvement of the community made a huge difference in terms of, of the outcomes of the project and the understanding in terms of, of the resource. So again, that citizen science, that public data, and the, and the data availability aspects. So I just want to talk very briefly about what makes good data, because it's one thing to collect data, it's another thing to collect data that's actually useful and good. So I summed it up as that continuous, persistent, and consistent. It's best to have frequent measurements. It's great, even better if they're long term, and also it's essential that they're in some way standardized. So we do have the Resource Inventory Standards Committee. Risk, the standards were recently updated. It's a, it's a great volume. You can download it and read it at your leisure. It puts almost everybody to sleep. Um, but it does give us like a defense, defensible quality assurance, quality control process. And if you follow it, it, it uh, basically shows you how to document your data and produce the metadata that supports it. So in 10 years or 100 years or something, somebody goes to download the data and collects it. If they know how it was collected, if they know the standard it was collected to, they know how to use it. So we want, we want good data. Um, the advantages of local data, Sylvia went over this, it's very labor intensive to collect data. So for, for me to go out and collect surface water data, that's all I'm going to be doing. And, and, Collected, so spent so much time in the field, I know she spent some time in the office, but we can't be everywhere in all 1,500 watersheds or on all 36,000 aquifers. So having the involvement of community members gives us that labor force that can address those, those data gaps in a way that we just are not capable of doing. But we can provide uh, the expertise, the training, sometimes the equipment in order to actually undertake the work. It gives you this, this local knowledge and, and commitment and passion and engagement. So I, I find, you know, for Sylvia and myself, we, we have a passion about our science because we pay a lot of money to get educated in it and we've spent many years working in it and we really enjoy it and we like doing good work. Um, I think there's a certain passion that comes from people who are very interested, connected to the land base, who live on the land base and have an interest in, in doing good things for the place that they live in um, rather than the alternative. Uh, improving the spatial resolution, that's sort of a no-brainer, we get more data. The other thing is that, that presence on the land base. Um, and that we think about a little bit as, as sort of a, um, a knowledge transfer thing. People out there looking at the rivers, looking at the trees, looking at whatever it is, and thinking about what's there today, thinking about what used to be there, and thinking about what may or may not be there tomorrow. And that if something does happen, there will be somebody there who notices, much like Bruce Coburn said, if a tree falls in the forest. <clears throat> like this tree here. Um, so some of our existing partnerships, this is our, our home stretch here. Uh, Sylvia talked about the Salt Spring Island thing. We've, we've had some surface water partnerships. Uh, it's collaborative monitoring where we've provided some training. We've shared resources. I've, I've shared some equipment we have that is generally just lying around. And we got some of the staff resources from some of the stewardship groups. And this sharing of expertise. So. Um, undertaking these investigations can be complicated, but we can hopefully cover the complicated part and leave you guys with the simple part. That's what I like to think. So here's one has some Creek, Regional District of Nanaimo. Wherever Julie is sitting, instrumental in this one. Um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Not you, Nick, but someone much different. <laughs> uh, Ministry of Forests, Lands, and so on. That's, that's myself. And some very uh, generous landowners adjacent to the stream who, who provided us access. So you can sort of see it up here. There's a very expensive hydrometric station. It's got a, a sensor in the river and a bunch of other sensors on it. We've got our staff cages up here. You can see here it is underwater at flood. And some of our staff and, and uh, interns undertaking a very dangerous discharge measurement. So we tend to undertake some of this stuff that's a little more tricky, and we can uh, farm the rest out to the, the local people. Unless you guys want to do the dangerous work, but it's okay too. As long as I'm not liable. Um, French Creek, this is also the RDM. Uh, same sort of partnerships, but the friends of French Creek have gone a long way on this. So uh, we did train them up on the use of the flow tracker. We got them out there, they've been out there gauging, they take staff gauge readings, they keep an eye on the system, they, they send us emails to let us know what's going on. Um, Saves us all those trips out there. They, they could use an instrument that would otherwise be gathering dust in our, in our warehouse um, and leave me to do the great office work. 
Uh, let's see, look. San Juan River, I, I wanted to put this one in there because this was a partnership with the uh, Apache Duck First Nation who are uh, in Port Renfrew. So Fishers and Oceans, they provided the equipment. Here's the, the station on an old bridge uh, pier. Uh, Flynn Rogue provide the technical expertise, and Apache Duck does some of the monitoring, some of the work out there. They, they use the data a lot for their fish swims and fish inventories, and uh, they have had a lot to say about how great it is to have real-time data that comes into it instantly. And also the, the San Juan Stewardship Roundtable is a big part of this in terms of funding and advocacy, which is a group that includes all, uh, all the timber companies in the basin, um, all the other stakeholders, landowners, and everything else. And you may recognize this fellow keeping a, a very stern watch on his staff as Pete Law. He didn't bring his buns that day, but <laughs> read that as you will. So, <laughs> Maybe staff there, they're the tune flow trackers, as this, those who were there yesterday can see that they are taking very delicate care of some $30,000 worth of high quality instrumentation. Um, we provided them training one day, they came out on the Englishman River and we showed them how to use it. And uh, so the, the people who have been trained, we kind of accept that they will trade the instruments between them and, and basically make use of them to take measurements. And the only thing is we like to see is that they submit those measurements to us for inclusion in the database so that we can make them available to everybody else. Um, there are a number of others, British Columbia Conservation Foundation, we've done quite a lot of work with them. They've, again, great sharing. Many they have had Enhancement Society, BC Parks, and, and some, other, some other groups all now cut off on this slide. But great opportunities for us, and I'm hoping great opportunities for them. Uh, one we wanted to highlight this, I think Julie put up this slide, but. MOE has a water quality monitoring network. You look at all these slides, or all these sites, MOE and their water quality staff has oscillated between about one or two people who does the actual water quality sampling. And if you could imagine how much time it would take for one or two people to manage all these sites, it would be staggering. So the fact that you can involve all these different groups up here to collect all this data is, is just incredible. And the value there is almost, we can't measure it, but I'll say it's almost a measure. So we'll leave you with this one. We have, I think, I hope at least, tried to impress all these things on this thing, and, and I'm sure there's one in every crowd. I think we left time for discussion or questions, did we? Yeah, absolutely. Great job. You provide a lot of really good and interesting information. Uh, you brought us ahead of schedule. So we've got lots of time uh, for questions uh, from the audience around some of the work that they've shown, how you as a steward, as a local government, or as someone else with an interest in a watershed, how you might take advantage of some of the information and learning opportunities uh, being offered here and help out, right? I really like this. Better information, better management. It's a really, really important uh, principle because what it says is if we can get better information together, so collaboratively, all working alongside each other, we're actually going to affect better and more positive outcomes. I see Ted Benigo put his hand up. So I'm sure he wants to talk a little bit about some of that agricultural information. Okay. Is this mic working? So uh, I'd like to propose a, a real life uh, question. And you talk about the impacts of groundwater and stream flow and vice versa and all that. What would have the biggest impact on stream flow? If you drill the well and you pump 300 gallons a minute for two days continuously, or that same well you pumped it at 50 gallons a minute for 12 days continuously. The amount of water you've drawn from the aquifer is the same. Is there any difference in the impact? If a train leaves, <laughs> <can't assist. laughs> this, this has a real life implication, and I have asked my group geologists before, and it doesn't matter. In my mind is the higher you pump the aquifer, even if it's for a shorter period of time, you will impact stream flow at some point. Well, I mean, the prevailing thought is that um, eventually, for a longer period of pumping, 
100% of what you're pumping is going to come from the stream. So overall, and, and there's ways that you could model like oscillating flow, turning on and off, but even if you turn on and off over a longer time frame, then essentially all of it is going to come from the system. So it doesn't really matter. But, but when, when we're talking about control. curtailment, when we're talking about turning people off, then we might consider how much they're pumping, how far away are they, and those types of things. So if we're wanting to get, um, considering the lag time within the aquifer response and to the end of the river, we might want to cut off people closer, for example, or who are pumping more. But it's not a one-time event. It happens continuously all summer long right through the low flow as well. So one person's pumping for two days, taking lots of water. The other person's taking less water, but for a longer period of time, repeated eight to ten times through the year. And I, I'm under the impression that the higher pumping rate would have a bigger impact on the stream at some point in summer, because the pumping water out of the aquifer is quicker. And if not impacting on other wells close by either, because the drunk water comes faster. And so it's just not something I've ever had a really good answer on. I, I, it's the same amount of water, but it just seems to me that higher pumping, and, and this is a real life scenario. We have thousands of wells going in. People say my well is capable of 300 gallons a minute. I'll put 300 gallons a minute pump in there. I only need 50, but I'm going to put in 300. And this is going on now as we speak. And I just think down the road we're running into a water management problem. Because you can't, you can't cut it back, you can't turn it back after the minute. We had this discussion around this not long ago, and it was the idea that the, it's, it's the, the establishment of the Kona Depression is time dependent, not rate dependent. I think that's it. So, depending on how fast you pump, depending on how long you pump for, depending on the total volume, will you, will you establish a gradient that will intercept the stream? And then when you stop pumping, will the condition relax for long enough? So, if there's a lot of factors in there that, that are unknown. I mean, if we could look at specific examples in terms of what's, what sort of aquifer you're pumping for, how well connected it is to the stream, what's the difference, what's the distance of the well that's the to pumping, and so on. But we, we do run into that question all the time of, you know, what's, can you pump at a slower rate and not have an impact? The thing is, I think when you, no matter what rate you pump at, you, you establish some sort of gradient towards the well you eventually begin drawing from the nearest stream. Yeah, like I said, it, eventually 100% of that water is still going to be coming from capture, no matter what the rate is. But if you, the, also, even, it depends on the aquifer property. So if you are pumping a lot and it's an you know, a high permeability aquifer, then your chromium depression will be smaller. Whereas if you've got a confined aquifer, the chromium depression could be very large responses like um, almost instantaneous several kilometers away. So it's complicated. Yeah, the reason why I ask it is because the groundwater regulation and the licensing process doesn't ask for a peak flow. It only asks for an annual usage. And I think if we were if it does have impact somewhere along the way for whatever reason you just explained, it would make sense that we put that into place because you're not going to turn it back 20 years from now and say, oh yeah, well, we should have had a peak flow in these wells, but we didn't, and now all these big pumps went in, and we're kind of stuck with it. Yes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There, are, there are certainly, the, I mean, part of, the, part of the issue there with issuing licenses is there's certain requirements, and then there's a certain amount of discretion. So aspects like that, it's, it's things that we may advocate for if we are asked for our input or a do a decision. So we may point those sorts of things out, but in some cases it is difficult to cover all the possibilities in terms of um, you know, an application for a groundwater license that, that, that may be relevant to a particular situation. But it's a good point. Hi. Hi. My name is Dorothy Chambers, and I run a uh, in New York enumeration fence on the Colquitts River in Victoria. The program's called Salmon in the City. The last two years, um, I have had the Ministry of the Environment and Department of Fisheries on a holiday weekend in October on the Colquitts River with low flows, and I wanted to um, understand a little bit better about the Water Sustainability Act and the low flow values. 
we have a uh, cold home coming up for the spawn entering the estuary with a flood tide and they're being left high and dry on the ebb uh, because there's such a, a tidal volume change and there's no water in the river. I have the ministry on holiday Monday doing flow checks which are uh, apparently adequate, not in the estuary. We have um, a, a new dam which has been built at the headwaters in Beaver Lake, out in Beaver Lake. And when I took an orientation with the CRD in Victoria on the uh, data loggers for water quality and sampling on the Colquitts River, the person that who had, was there from Vancouver who was doing the orientation said there are no low flow values that are recorded. The municipalities are only interested in the high flows because of the infrastructure damage and the, the damage to the neighborhood. So I, I'm feeling like from the knowledge that I've obtained and the fish that I've seen die in an ebb and flow on a low flow river well into November, I'm wondering where the values are that for the low flow that protect the uh, Caroline the Pobo. <coughs> After this session, come and find me because I'm interested. Ministry of Environment shouldn't be out there taking flow measures. They're, they're personal Ministry of Environment people. I have a really always be on their own time. I have a really good speed dial. Yeah, they're, they're on their own time. Yeah, so like you said, Colquitt is is regulated out of Beaver Lake through the dam. So historically, the dam's been non-functional for probably 10 or 15 years, and they had a single flow rate out of there. So now the dam is functioning since they constructed and they should be able to regulate it. Um, if there are concerns, the uh, this is why I wonder between Ministry of, of Environment and Ministry of Forest. So if Ministry of Environment staff are out there, they need to be relaying the information to the, the ministry that actually handles the licensing. So we had a similar concern a couple of years ago on um, Craig Flower, and within a few weeks we were able to, not us particularly, but the allocation department was able to Authorized releases from uh, which lake feeds in a regular hour. But in that situation, that was an intentional pullback of yeah. water from Phoenix Lake yeah. to prevent illegal cliff jumpers from jumping off the edges of Phoenix Lake into a water body that had lowered the levels to support the salmon run. It was putting illegal cliff jumpers at risk because of pit and underwater issues. And so for two years in a row, the Craig Flower watershed salmon cobo died because the creek completely dried up to protect an illegal activity in the Beavis Lake. Yeah, so, so, I mean, CRD is balancing their risk and their, and their resource, right? They could spend like a million dollars to restore Craig Flower Creek. So I know in that case they did get extra releases out. I don't know how that panned out. It's licensing is in our department, but I know that licensing turned that around very quickly and got water back in the creek. And my understanding from some of the correspondence I saw it was a positive impact. I believe CRD holds the license to the deal that they're at, at uh, Beaver Lake. So they would have to make the request if their license limits them in terms of the releases. But again, that's their primary lake for recreation, so they may be balancing other uses there. They, they don't do power generation. It is an emergency water supply. Um, you wouldn't want to drink it. Uh, but they have a water treatment facility for that, but it's also emergency firefighting, I believe, as well. So for the peninsula, in the case of uh, devastating earthquake or other other thing that may or may not occur, they, that would be their source for, for disease. <coughs> but anyway, there may be other factors to play as to why they're not releasing. Um, it may be a part of their license, it may be other management decisions, but that's not to say that uh, if there are impacts being felt, that that should be relayed up to the licensing folks in, in uh, Nanaimo. And it should also be put forward to the CRD as the license holder to try and see if there is something that can be done. Um, and then again, if, if there is assessment work to be done that, that would, uh, I guess, support the idea of what the flows should be in Colquitt's, you know, we would need to know about that in order to undertake it or find someone who would undertake it. So the, part of the problem is that 
it's obvious here you have some knowledge that we don't have. And so how do we share that knowledge and, and try and come up with a positive impact or, or some sort of solution to the problem? Right? So let's work together. Wait, yeah, we have let's talk together after this. Hello, my name is Lisa Aguirre. I'm from the uh, Beaufort Watershed Stewards. For those who don't know where the Beaufort mountain range is, it's just about 40 minutes, I guess, drive north of here. Um, we are a group that just started uh, a couple of years ago, just registered at the society uh, back in uh, November, and we started to uh, do some water sampling, um, surface water sampling. So Really um, happy to see, you know, the presentation about the interaction, the really, really close interactions between the surface water and groundwater. We have been um, doing some collections, as I said, of, of water samplings and, and doing, um, following the protocol of the uh, regional Nanaimo district. So we think that everything is standardized. We have been experiencing a bit of a challenge in trying to get the data to uh, the ministry. We understand that um, water sampling, surface water sampling data goes to Ministry of Environment, as uh, you said, and we understand that there is limited uh, resources for that. And then is this my understanding also that the groundwater data uh, goes to the uh, ministry of your ministry there at Fenroe? So, are you talking about water groundwater quality data? Yeah, the reason why I'm asking this question is because there's an underlying question. I would like to, uh, it, to me, it just makes sense that uh, these two types of data should be combined. You know, like we're dealing with Ministry of Environment and then we're dealing with Ministry of uh, Forest and so the, um, the environmental quality data, so sampling data from both surface and groundwater, are all housed in the environmental management system. So that's the Ministry of Environment manage that system, but Fulnero and Environment utilize it and um, the public. So it's a matter of establishing the site numbers. So are you talking about samples that are sent into a laboratory, for example? Or to no, just to the ministry, it's just, you know, um just sample data that we've been taking for, you know, in, in the summer period for five weeks, as Julie was mentioning earlier in her presentation, and then, you know, the five weeks and then in the fall, and so it's just a matter of really we're eager to send that data, but uh, no one seemed to be, you know, able to take that uh, data. Right, so, I mean, if you want to, we can touch bases after, um, and I can try to put you in contact with the right people. Sounds so, right. So the other question is, wouldn't it be better to have combined forces about the data? Like the, it, it seems like you know from your presentation, the uh, surface water is you know it's, it's connected to the groundwater. So they are combined. So it's one system, but it was because the environment management system was set up by the Ministry of Environment before it split out the resource sector pieces, and Flamero was established. So. I would say the environmental management system is a Flinero and environment system. It's just on paper. It's run by the Ministry of Environment, but we access it, we use it to, and equally. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Neil, Peter, I have a quick question for you. We are really bought into establishing some bulk full parameters and actually full parameters for small streams particular some tributaries here on the, on the Englishman. We know it's going to take a few years of data capture. I'm just wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about where where will this data go in terms of, because we know we're, we're, we're suffering from really low, low summer flows. Where will this data go to, to, to management decisions? And in particular, this drug management strategy that you I think I saw a slide up there in one of the 72 or so much. 85, it says. No, 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 I did the previous one. <laughs> just drug management strategy. Is, is that something that, that's, that 
problems in moving forward with to, to, to help small streams? It's a good question that the, I try to think of what we would think of when we think of the drought management strategy. In general, we were, we're responding to drought in a certain way, but it, it, it's not necessarily related to specific actions around licensing. Um, drought response tends to be more of a reactive response when drought is happening. But I think your question in the, what I'm hearing is, if you collect data, how do you get that incorporated into a decision? Yeah. And how, do you, how do you get your stream cut off? So what you're looking for is similar to well, yeah, so there's the drug portal. So this is a way to convey our drug level. So if, if we, if we, this, 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 the Coastal River and the Shamus River. So if those rivers are low, we may say it's, it's uh, level three or level four drug. Those things are encouraging conservation. So there's, there's levels of conservation associated with those. But I think in, in, in the case of your question, what you're looking for is, it's much like we saw in the Coastal where in 1980 they cut off surface water licensing. Um, <clears throat> It's a good question. I'm not sure there's an official way. Under our e-licensing system, it is possible for a, a, um, a water manager to flag a system as what we call fully recorded. And that means that there shouldn't be any more licenses issued on the system. But there is not an actual uh, administrative law method to prevent any license from ever being issued. I think that the, what you can do is you can build a case, like a strong case, to prevent licenses from being issued, and that would be um, supplying the data and making it available that demonstrates that the creek can no longer support any additional licenses. So um, fish inventories, flow well information, these sorts of things, where it's showing them that the habitat is basically at this point impacted or that the creek runs dry in the summer. We do have an environmental flow biologist, that's Yarrow, and he is uh, any licensing gets referred through him in terms of their questions around the EFNs. And so, if, in a way, the best way is to, is to make people aware of the, that the information is available to inform the decision. Because we get a lot of licenses on systems which none of us have ever seen, possibly could never even visit, um, and to know whether there's water there or not is, is, is very difficult. You know, we, we have a had a license a few years ago down in Cedar, where any water balance model will tell you there is no water there because he draws from a, from a ditch that is strongly connected to groundwater, but no precipitation falls for six months of the year, and you expect it to go dry, but it stays full all year round. So our best source of information is the farmer who says, I, I have three feet of water in my ditch all year. If, if we run that through a model, it says there's no water. So do we, do we cut them off because there's because the computer tells us no water, or do we initially get a license because the farmer tells us there is water? I don't have a good answer for that. Well, what about, I was going to say, people could also make a complaint. So if there was, uh, they could call a natural resource officer tips line um, if they have concerns about a specific, like a spill or um, you know, river running dry or something like that. And then, um, a compliance officer could assess the situation and bring the water staff on to assess it. Yeah, that, that, that's good. a good way to respond if the river is being run dry by allocation. So if somebody is taking all the water and running the river dry, then, then there is a response that, that, that can be organized uh, as a sort of a drought response. But if the river goes dry naturally and we want to try and put water back into it, that's, that's more challenging. Running the microphones. Uh, my name is uh, Mary Ann I'm with the Wally Creek And um, uh, this past summer, uh, Wally Creek in the two lower regions ran dry. It's a fish dairy creek. Historically, it supported gold salmon. The gold would have been there for a while. Or remediate it so that the coal uh, can come back. In the meantime, there's a lot of cutthroat stuff. This past summer, the two lower reaches ran dry. And uh, I was startled because I've lived beside the creek for 40 years and it's never run dry, over 40 years. So I walked up the creek and uh, 
one thing you need to know is that in Reach 3, there is the Greater Denial of Pollution Control Center, which is moving from a primary treatment center, a primary treatment uh, plant, to a secondary treatment, which is a very good thing. However, uh, when I investigated <clears throat> and we visited the site, we were told that in order to stabilize the huge um, concrete vats that are part of the secondary treatment, they had to dewater the creek. This site is right beside, it barely is, I think the, the, the edge of the site is right at the riparian uh, cutoff. So I walked the creek. I couldn't get into the, the uh, reach stream where, where it is, but we, we can see that I can see the water running from there, and then it disappears right at the beginning of reach two, going downstream. So I went to the reaches above the site, construction site, and this is the this is the place. If any, if, if the creek was ever to run dry, I would expect it to be the upper reaches. Well, it had regular flows that were comparable to the previous two summers. So uh, we, made, we went to the site. They told us that it was a, they were doing this dewatering, and they were putting one well, the water from the well, the upper well, back into the creek, the lower creek, the lower well. They were diverting into the sewer of coal. So. Uh, we asked them, is there, you know, this is a huge engineering project, could they not divert that lower well back into the creek uh, after taking the sediment out, which they have to do anyway to put it into the outfall. So we haven't had very good response. And the, the, they said they would start to divert, to divert the water back into the creek right around the 9th or 10th of September, and of course, it started raining then and didn't stop for a while. So I don't know whether they did or not. They're still going to be doing this dewatering, I believe, this next summer, and we're afraid that the creek will once again dry up and kill up all the fish in the stream. So what do we do? Another good question. So it, it does depend a little bit on what they've been permitted to do. So. If, if everything has been followed, they would have applied for some form of permit in order to dewater the stream for the works that they want to undertake. And it depends what the permit authorized. Whether they were authorized to dewater the entire length of the stream or whether they were isolating the section of the stream and pumping around. Without, without knowing that, it's how we do know. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have an authority. Well, okay, I can speak a little bit more detail or into things for. Um, okay, so Naya, thanks for yeah, sharing your perspective. This is an example of someone who, it's a presence, right? So someone on the creek, lives right there, has for many years, and it's that factor of presence, like someone's there and they can observe changes over time much better than someone who really did it in an office place, for an example. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of our wastewater services department, which is actually not my department, but we're related and, we, and we're striving to work together. But I think this comes back to, it's actually a good illustrative example of where engineering versus the biology um, works contemplated in concert in a, in a particular instance. So the dewatering wasn't actually up the creek, it was dewatering of the excavated site where the water, um, wastewater treatment facility is being constructed. But, you know, the dewatering of that site you know, the hydraulic connection to Wally Creek, I think, was underestimated by the, the initial engineering design to say, yes, we have to dewater the site to excavate and build our uh, facilities for the wastewater treatment uh, plant. Um, but the connection to Wally Creek, again, this predates the um, 2016 Water Sustainability Act licensing piece around groundwater. So the groundwater wells on the site to actually dewater for construction could go in without having to go through a licensing process, which is now in place for any um, you know, construction-based dewatering. You would have a temporary um, use permit or something along those lines, where it's like, you know, maybe you have the language temporary authorization. Well, I, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, local government are exempt. Okay, 
so they don't require a temporary use. It's a kind of a loophole. Um, right. They're not required to have a temporary use permit for dewatering or, or for or a license for dewatering. I would say. Okay, thanks for that point of clarity. So, but nevertheless, um, that was reviewed by our engineer department and his water services division. Got uh, a biologist to come back to the site and do a follow up assessment um, to actually change our practices and inform operations of that team in this coming dry period. So, you know, you can recognize maybe that, that uh, gap between sort of the engineering and the biology and the, the hydraulic connection between the groundwater and the creek was missed in the first round of engineering that predated 2016. But the practices moving forward this summer, um, again, it's about the dewatering the site, but then putting the water back into the creek, meeting the turbidity requirements, right? So making sure that any sedimentation is removed from that discharge before it enters the creek. And that was the primary obstacle of why it had to go out to the outfall and not back into the creek, was on the requirements for um, water quality for fish in the creek. So I think it's an illustrative example of, you know, you don't always get it right the first time, and there's some departments doing one thing, you know, in the best of interests, but then there's, you know, the community perspective boots on the ground that provides some insights, but that actually, the, the main message here is that can meaningfully change operations, right? And so I think you did a service now to bring that to attention, and, and maybe the gap wasn't closed from our engineering department back to you, um, but yeah, that sort of thing does influence operations and for the better, with those sorts of observations. Right now, he just quit. <laughs> 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 
I'm looking at you, Mosaic. <laughs> so you listening, we, we, we did have a fellow in, I don't know, it was five years, I think, something like that. Um, but yes, he, as of three days ago, was his last day. Uh, so there will be a competition if any of you feel qualified. To <laughs> it, is, it is a thankless and unforgiving environment. But <clears throat> we will be hiring someone in the interim. I mean, basically what happens is we have a licensing department full of people who uh, process the paperwork, they consider the application, they make a recommendation to the decision maker. <clears throat> it's their job to look at all the input, weigh all balances, so they're, they're considering First Nations, free the interests, they're considering the public interest, any stakeholder who has uh, what we call standing, so a stake in, in the resource that may be impacted, and then decide on the environmental flow needs aspect. And they will generally defer to our environmental flow needs biologist for his opinion on, on that aspect. Um, I would say that the more information he could have about uh, any particular system, which would be fish species presence and, and the flows that might occur, would, would create would go a long way for him to be able to make a more informed recommendation. So when, when uh, Sylvia put up on the Coast Island, we had one water survey of Canada station on that system. If, if you go on, on the water survey of Canada site and look at the real-time stations that are active today, they're on major systems, they're not on small watersheds. So, and you look at the density of licenses out there, there's thousands and thousands of licenses on every single system. So is it possible for one person to know everything about every system, about all the fish that can get somewhere? It's, it's just not. So it <clears throat> uh, goes back to what we're saying about having data that's available and knowing what data exists. The more we can kind of connect all the people and all the data together, the better we can make those decisions. But in some cases, uh, the volume of work that there is, you think of one person who's got to make all the recommendations for all the environmental flow needs for we say 72,000 square kilometers, um, it's very challenging. Well, but I would make a plug for in the summer time, like, so we have students, and, and so the Water Survey of Canada stations tend to focus on kind of year-round uh, flows and uh, winter conditions, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but their rating curves and everything are sort of biased toward those higher flow rates. Um, but locally, there have been efforts to try to capture some of those low flows within the systems. Um, they've gone through a prioritization, so this website reflects the prioritization of certain watersheds we think are going to be particularly vulnerable to low flows because of lack of storage structure. And so they've got students, uh, two student positions to help with um, getting out there in the field and collecting data and involving water authorization staff and going out and collecting low flow monitoring uh, data. But the if-end process is like, Sarah, you're asking about what is involved. And with the Cook Sila, like they did fishery inventories and they looked at different habitats. So they did capture uh, and release and counting, basically looking at the different environments um, and the presence and absence of the species and, and relative numbers. So it was a fairly in involved process to try to establish the if-end for that system. And it's probably not possible for them to do them for all of the systems. So I have one quick thing, because I see you're trying to cut us off, probably. There was a picture on Salisbury Mound that had Yarrow there, and he was involved in the teaching of everybody there. You know, we are available to come out and meet with whoever to try and show you the kind of data that needs to be collected and, and how to collect it, and try and collaborate with people in order to try and get this data and make it available for those sorts of decisions. That's a, to me, that's the best way to get it in there. Thank you. Neil and Sylvia, and I do think that that's really the important message. Uh, I, I really have to I agree with what Neil was just saying. We're in a position of trying to do the best we can, and sometimes we just do not have the ability or the resources or the information to know everything at every given time. So that's why these kinds of symposiums are important, because we're not afraid to ask for help. So. Neil, I thought you did a fabulous job yesterday. I uh, watched you in the stream a little bit, and if there's anyone interested in learning how to collect flow measurements and all of that and work with this group on collecting better information, I'd encourage you to get a hold of them. So thank you very much, Neil and Sylvia.